Hi there, Paul Thompson here from Spitfire Audio. I'm very excited today to show you the Kepler Orchestra. There are three things that this library is excellent at. Creating rhythmic orchestral motion from simple to massively complex, giving the impression of movement and speed, and repeated notes which are quite difficult to successfully sequence with traditional samples. Kepler is all about creating systems music in the 21st century, inspired by the great American systems composers of the 20th century, Riley, Reich, Glass, Adams, the composers who are the direct inspiration for Kraftwerk and Tangerine Dream, and more recent acts like Sufjan Stevens, Niels Fram, Cliff Martinez, and Devendra Bernhardt. The kind of uber cool moods that film, games, and TV producers are screaming out for can literally pour out of your fingers. A secondary feature is rebowing, which is nigh impossible to recreate with samples when writing more traditional but complex orchestrations. This library does the hard work for you. This is not a phrase library. Kepler interprets your music and plays it in ways you'd never expected. Recorded dry for ultimate control and blending with all of your other libraries. Anyone exploring the cutting edge of modern orchestration styles. This won't win your awards for you, but it will get you halfway there. This library is perfect for anyone who's looking for inspiration, anyone who wants to sound a bit different, anyone who wants to freshen their palate. Johannes Kepler was a German astronomer who discovered three laws of planetary motion. The library's core component is like a musical orrery, and those are the beautiful machines that you may have seen that illustrate in three dimensions the movement of the planets. At its heart, is a 40-piece string orchestra, 19 brass and 13 woodwind, recorded at Air Studio One, where we recorded our Bernard Herrmann and Studio Orchestra libraries. The four main elements are the main grid with all the rhythmical subdivisions, the momentum grid, shards, we imagine like light shards shooting past your head, dopplers, like sounds that move past you, as per the Doppler effect you get the pitch dropping, Finally, the fifth section is the warped content from two different sources, granular resynthesis of our organic recordings, and then our more traditional outboard effects mangling those recordings into new sonic soundscapes. Let's jump straight in. So first up, let's check out the high strings and let's check out the main grid. Now you can see across the top, we've got the note values of the individual pulses, but they're separated up into firstly duple time, then triple time, quintuple and septuple. So let me give you a quick demonstration. So as you can hear, this is the minim in duple time. Um, and then if I go to the next subdivision, it will be twice as fast. And so if we jump to the semiquavers, and similarly, you've got the triplet semiquavers, and so on, quintuplet, and finally, septuplet. Now, there are lots of ways you can use this. So let's jump back to our crotch here. Um, we can play things uh, and move around as we're playing them. So you hear that all of the notes that are continuing are just uh, playing, they're rebowing, and these are real recordings. So you're, you've got a whole load of rebows before you finally loop around back to the beginning again. So this will always sound natural. Um, when you are playing, there are two different ways to do it. You can either do it by feel and by sound, like I'm just doing, but we also have a quantize the input section here. So that will take your MIDI input to the plugin and will quantize it to the next beat. And you've got, uh, if I move through these, you've got um, the whole bar, you've got half, quarter note, um, triplets, eighth, eighth triplets, sixteenth. You, you see it's very, very configurable um, as to how you quantize the input. And that, that will help you sometimes to keep things in time, um, especially if you're playing live or you've got, um, you know, a, quite a complex sequence going. Now the second way we can do it is we can use offset timings. So So 
So you can hear that you can build up rhythms that could just be Or you could do things that are slightly more complicated. And this way you can build up really quite interesting cross rhythms if we do that with the semiquavers. Or So there's lots of different ways of doing this. Now, one of the obvious things that I haven't done yet is setting a different a subdivision of the bar on the keyboard so that certain ranges of notes play a certain subdivision. And that can be really fun and interesting as well. So let's just set something up here uh, and see where we go. We'll just use the tuple time at the moment. I'll just play a big chord. So that's one way of doing it. We could also add in some interesting little bits of triplet feel here and there. And let's try the same kind of thing again. So you start to get a feel for how this, you can use this in lots and lots of different ways. You can get something that set that is just, uh, I always I think of that orrery, as I mentioned in the in the intro, because I can picture as I'm listening to this, um, that kind of beautiful old fashioned machinery moving things around and and things kind of moving in and out of time. And that's that's where the real fun comes with this. The way that we recorded this was immensely complicated. Um, in order to get, obviously you can't just put a chart in front of a musician and say, right, play septuplet quavers uh, or semi-quavers at this BPM. It's really, really hard. I mean, obviously they'll do their best and it will be pretty accurate, but it's not going to be totally 100% accurate. So there are, we used a variety of workarounds so that we could start with one bar and then subdivide it, subdivide it. So you have a bar divided in two, divided in three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. So if we put some of those sevens in here, and let's use a couple of these ones like this, and then play another big chord. So I'm trying to get the timing exactly right just by kind of feeling where I think the bar is going to start. Obviously, when you're doing something really, really tight metronomic, you would play this in and then quantize it or use the quantize input as well. So let's just go back very quickly to the normal semiquavers, duple semiquavers, and I'll just show you what the different mics sound like. So up here we have the closest mic. And we've got a little bit of delay and reverb on there. Let me take those off completely. So you're hearing the sound. I'll just reduce the release a little bit. So you're hearing the sound as dry as possible. So you hear there very, very clean, very crisp, dry sound. Um, nice and easy for you to be able to blend in to other libraries recorded in different spaces. Here is a kind of mid stage sound. Looking at the wide sound next. So here you're starting to get more kind of, more of a feel of that it's been bouncing around the room by the time it gets to the mics. And here is the most ambient sound, just level balance these. So that's probably about the level that you would want that to be at. And if I put the um, close mics and the mid mics back in. So you can hear it's really easy to get the kind of exact sound that you want to blend the sound that you want. And when we put the reverb back in, first of all. It gives us a really lush space to sit the sound into. And then I do like a little bit of delay, especially on these timings. 
maybe a little bit too much there, but um, it does sound nice with a little bit of extra bounce in the background. Now let's look at the muted grid next. So this, again, you have all of the same subdivisions, but this time the strings are muted. And again, we can go through all of our different subdivisions, but here's a little quick example. And here I'm using the quantize in, because I'm recording this in Pro Tools, um, and the MIDI clock is just running in the background, I'm able to use the quantize in um, to tighten up what I'm playing so that you're hearing everything nice and precisely there. Again, the same subdivisions, but looking at the Solpont grid. So it's really easy to create some interesting interlocking rhythms and we're only using one subdivision here at the moment. Next up is our muted tremolo grid. Have a listen to this, this is absolutely lovely. So as you can hear, you're getting the accent for the timing of the grid and then you're getting that beautiful soft uh, tremolo um, muted tremolo in there as well. Now when you start to look at the larger subdivisions you get a really interesting sound and if we combine that with some of these fabulous quintuple divisions here then you can get a, a really interesting pulsing kind of sound in there. So that's, that takes us through our, our subdivisions, our kind of timing subdivisions, the main kind of grids. So let's look at the next of the four sections here. This is the momentum grid. And this gives you a feeling of kind of undulating momentum. And if I play this using the slowest sound here, So you can, you can see what's happening here is we've got a slow build up, a kind of faster diminuendo, and then a slow build up again. And it's, let's, if we go to something that's a little bit faster. So again, looking at making a, a really kind of interesting texture from these. So you can hear how these are going to work with the with the timings. Also it's important to say at this point that this these all tempo lock to the sequencer tempo that you're using, your host tempo. So doesn't matter what you um, what tempo you change to, um, everything will lock to the tempo that you're working at. Now, a variation on the momentum grid is the pulsing momentum grid, and that sounds like this. So you can hear what's happening here. Let me turn again to a faster version of this and you'll be able to hear in slightly more detail what's going on. So it's exactly the same shape as the momentum grid but it's subdivided into these pulsing textures. So as you're getting that crescendo building up, the crescendo is actually pulsing on its way up. Um, and this is a really fantastically useful sound. The final part of the momentum section uh, 
is, an, is a, another variation on that, which is an accelerating momentum section. And the concept behind this was to get that feel of something which is gradually accelerating and then gradually decelerating, slowing down again. Um, and this was uh, very tightly scored out. So it's, it's to get a kind of feel that it's happening almost kind of ad hoc, almost improvised, but it's actually very, very tightly scripted so that it absolutely will fit together again as the different sections with the different timings. Check this out. And again, this goes round and round. If we use a slightly faster variation, and you can hear what's going on there. So again, within these subdivisions and against your your kind of backing or whatever you've, you've got kind of running in the background, these will create really beautiful and interesting cross rhythms as the sound develops and then fades away. Another great way of adding rhythmic texture into a track that you're already writing. Now the third element is shards. These are essentially like uh, carefully shaped crescendos that then stop dead and I'll play you uh, an example. Let's just actually go to a slightly shorter note to hear this. So these are like light shards coming past your head. Now there are two different ways of using this. You'll hear that some of the notes are ending at slightly different time. We actually quite like this um, as an effect. And, and the reason if you switch to a slower sound and have a listen, it gives you a really interesting textured finish. Just check this out. Personally, I really like that. If you want everything to absolutely end on the same time, then you have an alternative, which is to use the time machine version. Now, the final part of the four sections that we have um, applies to the brass, which I will jump into now. We'll go into the low brass just to get through these four sections. Um, and these are called the Dopplers. As I said, the Dopplers are to give the effect of something moving towards you and then moving past you. Um, and as you probably know, um, the Doppler effect is basically the compression of sound waves as they move towards you with a, an object that's moving like this. You get the sound waves compressed. And then as the object moves away from you, the sound that it's emitting, the sound wave becomes expanded because it's traveling away while it's emitting the sound. And therefore, the pitch seems to be lower. And that sounds like this. Now we have two different versions of this. We have the pulsing one like that, and then there is a non-pulsing version. And both of those sounds are absolutely loved. While we're in the low brass, let's jump back to the grid and I can start to show you some of the other sections of the orchestra. Okay, so let's just pick a chord and have a listen. Something a bit more open. Again, we can look at different timings and get the interesting cross-play between the sounds. and even using some of our triplet sounds in there as well. And if we go in and just listen to one of the faster ones, So 
So you can hear there lots and lots of potential for timing fun. Now, if we go into the momentum grid again, And you can hear how that is kind of doing that amazing swelling thing. Let's jump to a faster subdivision. And check out the pulsing version of this. And finally, the accelerating version as well. And again, you get those fantastic cross rhythms that are going to emerge against your track. Let's look at the shards, particularly like these with the low brass as well. Fabulous stuff there. Again, I've got a little bit of delay on here. You can obviously take that off if you don't want it. Um, but I do, I do like the effect that it gives of the of the kind of after burn or the kind of memory of, of what's just happened. Um, just think all those little things add some lovely texture to things. And as before, we have the shards available to play on the time machine if you want to make sure that they're absolutely tight. But again, the caution with the time machine is that if you're playing the semitones, you might um, get a slight bit of phasiness creeping in because of compressing things back to exactly the same length within such a tight uh, pitch difference. But let's have a listen. It does sound slightly different, but um, I like the timbre of it. So it's a sound that you could use to special effect if you really wanted to do that. And again, Let's look at the um, Dopplers with the time machine on. So again, everything absolutely in time. Still sounds fine on there. So let's look at the next section. I'm going to look at the celli um, and jump back to strings. And let's go straight into something a little bit faster. Again, we can mix these up to get some really interesting cross rhythms. Let's put a couple of little triplety things in, maybe one five. Let's see what we get. Nice, and then we've got the muted sound as well. So you've got a huge range here with the cello, um, but we can set up those really good cross rhythms as well. It's, um, it's just such a lot of fun working with this. It can be incredibly inspirational. Um, it's one of those things that, that can get you started on a cue really quickly when you've got that blank page staring at you and you're thinking, oh, God, how do I get going? Um, we've got the same kind of stuff. The uh, Soul Pot, let's have a quick listen to the muted tremolo uh, stuff, which is beautiful up high. And with the faster subdivisions.
Let's check out the pulsing momentum grid. And I really love the way that the that if you use the momentum grid and you change notes, um, just as the as the swell has kind of started, you get this really nice extra texture. So you've got the timing stuff going on, but you've also got the individual notes are starting on their journey um, of the that kind of crescendo, that increase in volume and and kind of intensity. And you get um, an extra kind of element to the tapestry. It gives you a really kind of 3D kind of texture, um, which I particularly like. If we go, uh, if we look at the triplet crotchets and then we add in a few of the septuplets and just have a quick look at this. So on the keyboard, you can see blue notes are my triplets and my green notes are my septuplets. So um, if I just play these two, I'm going to play the Cs, triplet at the bottom, septuplet at the top. And you can hear that kind of movement as it changes. And if we put down something slightly more complex, here we go. But it's not something you would immediately think of to take your triplets and then overlay them with septuplets. And in fact, if I put the, uh, at the bottom, I'll just put the one back in. Have a listen to this. So you can see there, you're really getting a dense and complex sound. You almost might use, uh, you know, just a I'll pull all of these down a tiny bit. You almost might just say, right, no effect. I'm going to keep this bone dry uh, and have another listen. So you can hear that there. Let me play something over octave C. So I'm adding a little bit more strength onto the four. Yeah, you're getting the feel there for the for the rolling notes. And again, we've got the accelerated momentum grid. And I don't think I've put um, subdivisions into this yet. So let's just hear that with just with two notes at the moment. So you can hear how there's a rolling round. Really uh, useful sound. Let's go to the shards. So listening through these with the cello. Uh, I love the, the end of the notes. Just check them out. And you get that beautiful extra little bit of vibrato at the end. Pretty tight, but you can also use the, if you want to eliminate any kind of timing discrepancy of the endings, which again, I quite like, but if you want to eliminate it altogether, then you can, um, you can load up the Time Machine version. But then watch out for when you're playing uh, to a semitone within the same note center, that's the only time it, it happens. Comparing that with two note sensors, as you see, it's not a gigantic difference, but um, but it does change the sound slightly. Now let's go for the Dopplers. I really do love these Dopplers in the cello. Uh, check this out. <laughs> a 
fantastic. The non-pulsing ones, I'm going to use a slightly faster subdivision. And then again, if you're if you want to use um, the pulsing one, but you want them to remain absolutely in time as before, use the time machine version. Now, while we're down here, let's look at the bases. The bases have been recorded separately um, so that you can control whether they're playing in with the cello in octaves which is more common, or whether you want them at unison. But let's have a quick listen to them on their own. And going for a faster subdivision. So you hear there, you've got the same kind of stuff, you've got the same subdivisions. Um, if we move on, we've got some really great stuff with it, which is just in the basses, which is the pizzicato grid, which I love. That's incredibly useful. And again, you've got four different subdivisions to use in there. You've also got Colenio grid. And this fabulous tremolo grid, check this out. Which works really beautifully with the faster subdivisions as well. Things like this where you've got the the kind of the um, flowing on from the previous note, it's these kinds of things are just impossible to recreate with traditional sampling and having them in this kind of grid system where you can pick from different subdivisions of the beat and then play them as if they're you know as if it's just a kind of normal playable instrument it's not phrase playing it's not a phrase library it's got a huge amount of control but it gives you that amazing sound that just uh, brings everything to life we've got a few notes in the harmonics register which sounds great. I mean, bass harmonics notoriously um, difficult and kind of unruly, um, but we've harnessed a few of them here. Here's a great tremolo harms grid. And again, just using that riffing off the different kind of quantize points and going in so that they're not you're not just playing them all on the beats is a really interesting way to do stuff as well. The shards are particularly powerful and aggressive in the basses. And again, you've got the two options to time machine them to get them absolutely in time or to get that textured finish to the notes. Um, the Dopplers sound really good down here as well. So let's jump to the high brass next. Now, as you can see, you still do have a wide range, even though this is technically the high brass of those instruments that are playing up there. If we go to a faster subdivision. And we can take off, if we want to lose that final little repeat, we can take off the delay altogether and bring the release down a little bit. Let's look at the shards here. I particularly love these. Uh, 
and same thing with the time machine. Not exactly the same, A instead of C at the top. But you get the idea. Again, time machine option just tightens all the ends up. Um, so some fabulous stuff in there. Um, we looked at the low brass, so let's check out the woodwinds. Now, the woodwinds is a section that really does benefit from having repetition, played repetition, um, because the starts of all the notes are a tiny bit different. So check this out. And again, just messing around with the um, starting of the notes, but you can put in some of these lovely uh, different, let me get some of the triplet stuff going up here, actually. Um, you can really get some beautiful things going on. And just to look at a couple of different things, let's put up the momentum grid. And applying that different technique where we change the notes. Just again to add that kind of third dimension, those real undulations. Let's check out the shards. We'll pop up the time machine version first. Really cool. Let's look at a faster one. And if I turn off the quantize, I'm able to kind of spread the starts. I'm in the time machine patch, doesn't really matter, but um, check this out. So you can get those deliberate spreads or even a chord uh, homage to Jerry Goldsmith. And the pedants amongst you will know that I'm playing one of those chords slightly differently. <laughs> But there we go. OK, so the final section to have a look at is the warped section. And there is just some great, great stuff in here. So check out a couple of these sounds. So you've got from your kind of, you know, more clearly organic origin sounds there that's just sounding a little bit like a kind of um, synthy kind of pad sound to things like this. Where we've created this fabulous pluck sound from, a, from an organic source. There's a couple of really great ones here. This is one of my favourites.
great crunchy version of the pulsing Dopplers there. And all these processes kind of also giving you that slightly otherworldly kind of sensation as well. This one I love, which is like um, a kind of profit five on acid. Some fabulously aggressive sounds in here. That is a quick look through the Kepler Orchestra. Um, one thing which I will point out to you, which is really useful as well before we finish, is that there are accompanying each of these sections, there are snapshots. So if you want to jump very quickly to Something like, you know, uh, Time Madness, for example, is a great setting. Um, but you can go uh, for a duplets. They're kind of like presets within the within the patches. Um, but that's also in there for a quick and easy, oh, just get me up and running and just try something. And then you can start tweaking from there. And also, very last thing, finally, within the mix folder that's inside each of the um, instrument setting folders, um, you'll find a mix version which just has a single mic position. And then you've just got a pre-mixed version, which is um, memory saving, just to give you a combination of the mics in a quick and easy to load patch. So that's the Kepler Orchestra. I hope you've enjoyed this quick look through. Very, very proud of this. As I mentioned, just to summarize, we've got the four sections. We've got the main grids, which have got those all those incredible subdivisions of the bar, the different time subdivisions so that you can set up your own musical orrery to play with. Um, we've got the momentum section, which has got those great crescendos. Um, and that kind of feeling of momentum with the pulsing momentums as well and accelerating momentums. We've got shards, those flashes of light coming past you. That's, again, a great sound to use. Um, and these could be used just to make their own thing, but they're also really great, useful stuff to put in with your other sounds. Um, and then finally, on the lower instruments, we've got those fantastic Dopplers where the sound seems to come towards you and then go past in pitch. Um, the fifth and final section being the great section of kind of warped content, which will add another musical colour to your palette. So whether you are just looking for something to help you with your rebowing or re-blowing parts, um, something to help add a little bit of extra realism or something to add rhythmic dynamism to your tracks, or whether you want to really go full Adams, full Reich, and make your own systems music and just add that really cool palette of material to your repertoire. This is a really great resource. It's really intuitive and easy to use. It's very inspirational, and I hope that it will help you to make some really great music. Thanks very much for watching. Look forward to seeing you on the next one. Bye-bye.